Hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk, as we continue on in our new series, In Search of Christianity. On behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, Hi. we want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and glad that you can join us for this session. Um, we're yet, this is our second time in this new series, and it is a very scriptural, often hard look That's right. at what Christianity truly is as we go in search of Christianity. So we're going to start now, but before we do, I'm going to ask Brother Mark if you will ask God's blessing upon our time together. Okay. Oh Lord, we thank you that you are here with us among us, and uh, we just pray that you show us your word and show us how to live it. Amen. 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 Before I start uh, this session, I wanted to say something. Okay. I'm asking you basically to reevaluate your understanding of what Christianity actually is. Mm -hmm. So you have the right to ask what qualifies me to do that. Okay, you've, you've probably... I mean, people have been talking about what Christianity is for basically 2,000 years. What, why do I sit here now and say, okay, I, I, I have to search for it because I don't see it on the horizon here. So, yes, you can ask me what my qualifications are, but you have to be prayerful when you do that. I want to just read you what Jesus said, and I'm reading from John chapter 7, the Gospel of John chapter 7, at verse 14. It says, but when it was now the midst of the feast... Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. My qualification I can tell you all of my worldly qualifications, and they don't mean a darn thing. The only thing that matters is that God has either called me to this, or he has not called me to this. That what I'm teaching is the word of God, or I'm going to give you my opinions. All too many people are very learned, you know, go and have lots of numbers and names and uh, letters yes. after their, that's, thank you, letters after their name. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a thing at the end of the day. Remember, it was the Pharisees who were the educated, who stood opposed to Jesus Christ, who is the truth. Amen. Pray that I don't share my opinions. Amen. And test everything that I say against the word. You know, John wrote in his first letter, and he said, Beloved, do not, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into this world. Don't take my word for anything. Test it. But test it not against your traditions, not against your opinions, but test it against the Word of God. Because that's what we're seeking, is to understand Christianity from the only true objective source, the Word. This time I want to start again by getting back into the definition of Christianity. And the first thing in the definition of Christianity that you need to understand is that it is a relationship. Okay? Mm -hmm. Christianity is first and foremost a relationship with God the Father obtained through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's a statement that's, that's worthy of, of really getting into your head, right? Because that's what Christianity is all about. It's about a relationship with God the Father. That's only available through Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. Now, this is the statement I'm going to make, and this, this becomes a foundational truth for this entire series, however long the Lord allows it to go on. Mm -hmm. Christianity was never meant to be a new religion. That's right. 
It was about restoring the old relationship. When Adam sinned, he and the woman were kicked out of the garden. Their relationship with God was broken. They were separated from, not only from the garden, not only from the tree of life, but they were separated from God at that point, right? That was the death that God spoke of. He said, in the very day that you eat of that fruit, you shall die. That death was separation from God. The relationship was broken. What Christ brings us through his atoning work is the ability to come out of the tomb and into life. So it's new life. Christianity is new life. It is resurrection. Okay, as we're recording this now, we're, we're here in the Passover slash Easter season, all right? Mm -hmm. Which is all about that passage from life to death. It is all about going from death to burial to resurrection. That's what it is. There is a gateway into this relationship with God the Father. Yes. Jesus said it. He said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. John 10, 9. For a lot of people, especially religious people, mm -hmm. they find this whole thing hard to understand oftentimes. And I think one of the greatest scriptural examples of that is Nicodemus. Yes. Now, Nicodemus was a leader of, of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was a well, totally educated man. Mm -hmm. And he had heard and seen Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God was prodding him. This is the truth. So he comes to Jesus, but he comes in the night. Because he's, a, he's concerned about what, what people will say, right? Yeah. And he starts to go into this conversation and ask Jesus Christ questions. And pow, Jesus cuts right to the chase. And Jesus' answer to Nicodemus, to the question he didn't ask, was, you must be born again. You have to be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay? That being born again is having a new father. Yes. Because until the point that you're born again, you are a descendant of Adam. You're not a descendant of God, and you're not made in the image of God. No. You're made in the image of Adam. Yes. Now, we've done a lot of studies on this, okay? But, you know, think about it. Pray about it. The fact is, when Adam sinned, he no longer looked like God. He was made in the image of God, but now he had the stain of sin on him. He, he, had, he had the deformity of sin on him. And he and the woman who became Eve then gave birth after their own kind. Mm -hmm. And it says that the sins of the father are visited upon the children, generation after generation. And each father then passes it along. Mm -hmm. You were born into this world with a curse, the curse of sin. And the only way to change that is to change fathers. And that's what it means to be born again. And without that, being born again, you can't, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Okay? How does this happen? Well, it's very clear in Scripture. Okay? It says in Romans 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Is that, that simple enough? Yes. All right, then the, the logical consequence of that is to understand that a person, in order to be saved, to come back into that right relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ, you have to believe in your heart. That's right. And then you have to confess with your mouth. Well, that said, and I said, listen, I said this is going to be controversial. And I'm not, I'm not afraid of controversy in, in our quest for the truth, right? You need to not be afraid of controversy too, but you have to be seeking the truth. In order for a person to become and in, come into that right relationship with God the Father, you have to believe. Believe what? Well, believe this. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever will accept that, receive that, believe that, will have eternal life. Well, more than half the church that I know of, well more than half of the quote-unquote church on the face of the earth, believes in practice that 
you can you can pour water on a baby's head, mm-hmm. baptize an infant, and all of a sudden that infant becomes part of the church. And being part of the church is what establishes a relationship with God. Well, that is exactly upside down. Mm-hmm. Having a relationship with God makes you part of the church. Being part of the church does not make you a, a relationship with God. You have to choose. You have to. Now, the scriptures talk about dedicating babies. Yes. And I surely, surely believe in that. Right. And it's a reasonable uh, uh, presumption in scripture that godly people would raise godly children. Although there are great examples of that not working. Yes. Okay? But that's why the foremost command in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is that you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your, all your mind, all your soul, right? And, but then it says, it goes on to say in the next verse that then that you have to, the fathers have to Train pass on. that knowledge on to their children. Mm-hmm. When? All the time. Mm-hmm. When they're in the house, when they're out of the house, when they're in the way, when they're out of the way. All right? They're to train up their children in the ways they should go, right? So that they will at some point make that conscious choice for themselves. There are a lot of people who have entered into the church, into the roles of the church, the organized church, who don't have a right relationship with God the Father. Mm-hmm. Because that only comes from what the scripture said. Remember, the scripture is our guide in this. Right. You have to make a conscious choice yourself. Okay. This is significant. Because, you know, a lot of people think that they have a right relationship with God and they're destined for an eternal life with Him because of something they didn't take part in. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's just not scriptural. And that's why I'm saying we're in search of real Christianity. We need to get back. You, you should know when you were saved, if it was a conscious choice. Absolutely. Some point in time. I mean, you know, it, maybe, maybe it was one of those earth-shaking events in your life, like it was with the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. And maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just that working of the Holy Spirit, tingling in your spirit. But the fact is, Somewhere along the line, you should know that you made a conscious decision to accept and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I would think that death would be something you would know about in your own life. Death would, you probably have a good good idea that it happened, yeah, yes. Yeah. And new life should be something that you have Absolutely. an idea that it happened, all right? Um, I, people, I, people are following the traditions instead of the, the Word, the instructions of the Word. And there's nothing new in that, because this, you know, in the time of Jesus himself, yeah. he said this to the Pharisees, to the, to the religious people of his day. He said, how, you know, he, they had basically established everything based on traditions. Mm-hmm. And he said, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your traditions, mm-hmm. teaching the doctrines, the precepts of men, as if they were the commandments of God. Okay, we, we, I don't want to, what I want to know, and this is where I said, I'm not looking to give you my opinion. I want to give you the word of God. Because most of the church is built on other people's opinions, Mm -hmm. on the traditions of men, on the precepts of men, rather than on the commandments of God. And what what arises, and if you know the Bible, you know know the account of the wheat and the tares. What what arises is something that calls itself Christianity, may look like what you think Christianity looks like, but it's not that relationship with God. And if it's not that relationship with God, it's not Christianity true Christianity. And what I said was very important. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. He came to reestablish an old relationship, to restore us to that right relationship with God the Father, something that only he could do. Because like Jesus said, John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. No other way. And there's, um, there are people that believe that people are saved because they say, I believe in God. Well, you know, it says in the Bible that the devil, the devil. Exactly. The devil believes in God. It's not believing in God. It is accepting him and believing in him as both your Lord. That means he has complete rule over your life. Oh, that's right. 
and your Savior. That He did for you what you could never do for yourself. But so many Christian religions are based on a, a salvation by works. And the scripture is clear about that. That, that, our, that our salvation is not by works, lest any man should boast. It is the free gift of God. It is by grace. And our works are as filthy rags before the Lord. When you're trying to establish your own righteousness. Like that. That's right. Yeah, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, Christianity is about relationship. Yes. The second thing you need to know is that Christianity is about commitment. Remember, now these are things I mentioned yes. last week, but I wanted to get into them. Christianity is a commitment to Christ without concern for cost or consequence. Okay? Without concern for cost or consequence. One of the things I used to say a lot, maybe I'll, I'm, so I'm saying it again now. To have the peace of Jesus Christ reign and rule in your heart, you need to understand that the Lord is in control of your life. And to those who know that the Lord is in control, the consequences are always inconsequential. Mm -hmm. What can man do me? That's, That's right. All right? So, there's only one word that I know of that really accurately describes what our commitment to the Lord must in fact be. Total. All. A-L-L. -L. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Jesus said, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, the rich young man came to Jesus and Jesus, he said he wants salvation, he wants that eternal thing. And he said, and Jesus says to him, well, one thing do you get lack. He says, go sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. So, a lot of Christians today think, Phew, Glad he didn't say that to me. No, he didn't say that to you. But here's what he did say to you. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Luke 14, 33. All. All. There's a beautiful old hymn that people don't like to sing, I don't think, anymore. I surrender all. This is a this is a, a, a this is a faith of total commitment. It's based on total commitment because you would never have the opportunity to have that relationship with God the Father had it not been for the total commitment of His only begotten Son Jesus Christ, who humbled Himself, gave Himself up, and died even to the death on the cross. That's total commitment. And that's what God, I was going to say, that's what He requires of us. That's what He demands of us. Total, total commitment. Now that means, you have to understand that so many people are being drawn into what is called Christianity by the promise of lovely things. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, just, just sign the card here and become part of the church and you're going to get healthier, wealthier, skinnier, wiser, richer. Um, there's something you need to know because this is the Word of God. If you are a Christian, if you become a Christian, you need to know what Jesus said. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and he said, All, there's that word again, indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And then John went on to say in his first letter, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. This is not a comfortable religion. We've made Christianity, you know, this fluffy, nice religion with all the prosperity abounding around us, pastors flying around in their private jets, living in wonderful homes, the, 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 the headquarters of the biggest religion, you know, just luxurious as you can possibly make it. The fact of the matter is Jesus Christ 
talking about the cost of following him, said to a man who said, you know, he wanted to follow him, he said, consider this. The foxes have dens, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If you're looking for something comfortable in this world, this is not the place. What you, what you come to is that assurance of eternal life and, and glory with him. That mansion that awaits us in the sky. There's a logic to this. In that same first letter of John, in the fifth chapter, he said, we know this. We, we know that we are of God. And that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, bear in mind, that letter was written after the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. That letter was written after the day of Pentecost. And he wasn't saying, oh, we've taken over the world. He was saying, we know that this present world lies in the power of the evil one. And that evil one, the devil, Jesus said he comes only to steal kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10, 10. You know, we're living in perilous times, those perilous last days. As we're filming this now, just recently, there was an attack in Kenya. Now, I, I have something of a heart for Kenya. Alice and I have spent time in Kenya. I've ministered in many, many places in Kenya. And as a matter of fact, we were in Nairobi the day before uh, a couple of years ago, the day before the attack on that, that, that mall, where 60-some-odd Christians were slaughtered in that mall. Well, just the other day, at a university in north northeast of uh, Nairobi, Al-Shabaab, that militant Islamic group from Somalia, went in and slaughtered. Now the number is about 150 people. And what they did... Where they, they separated the Christians from the Muslims, the students. And if, a, if, a, if somebody responded to the question, are you a Christian? And they said, yes, pow, they shot them right in the back of the head. Or they tortured them, as they did in Kate Westgate. Okay, so I mean, it's not, not a pretty sight. But Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. Okay? Mm -hmm. The problem is, if you have that confrontation and somebody says to you, and you know that the cost is death, of the flesh. That's right. What are you going to do? Well, you had better be prepared to do what Jesus said. Don't deny him. Don't deny him. No. Don't deny him. We can sit here in the West. We can sit here in, in the United States of America. And that's kind of, okay, that may pop up a couple of times on the news in your life. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem to be the reality of our religion. But through much of, if not most of the world, that is the reality. That's right. That there is persecution for being, for following Jesus Christ with a scriptural faith. Now, having said that, I want you to know that the persecution is great here in the United States. But it is more subtle, yes. less overt. And it's typically, at the moment, it's not at the price of a gun put at the back of your head. But they'll destroy, they'll destroy your name. They'll destroy your, your work life. They will attack the enemy. Remember, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against that evil one, that powers and principalities. He will do everything in his power to destroy your life. That's his purpose. Okay. So if you stand up for what you know are, are the, is the biblical truth of following Jesus Christ, don't think you can do that without cause. And, Amen. and having said that, I want to remind you that the people that called for the death of Jesus Christ were the people of God, the religious leaders right. inciting them, right? So that your commitment to Jesus has to be equal to his commitment to you. He gave his life for you. He died for you. Your commitment has to be equal. This is, this is not a soft religion, Okay. But thank God that he has poured his Holy Spirit, his love into our hearts, written his word on the tablets of our heart, and given us the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. That you have the power, the ability, the strength to stand against the enemy. We couldn't do it on our own. We no, you can't do it on your own. You can't, okay? That's why we don't lean on our own understanding. But Christianity is about life through death. 
Remember, Jesus, in, in the Gospel of Mark, it says, Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Hallelujah. Okay? That's why Paul can say, rejoicing, he can say, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. In Colossians 3. What does God want from you? I'm going to tell you in a, in a word. Humility. Yes. It says, have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. Humility. All right? Humility is the death of self. Yes. Or the opposite of pride. It is exactly the opposite of pride. Pride is exalting yourself, raising yourself up. Humility is lying yourself down, dying to yourself. All right? And that's what God desires in our life. And he said, but if we do that, if we humble ourselves, he will then exalt us. Christianity is about worship. And I will tell you that the church, by and large, does not understand worship. Okay? Worship is the offering of oneself on the altar, or offering what is most precious to you. The first example of worship in the Bible is Abraham taking his son, his only son, Isaac, up on Mount Moriah and offering him to God, as God told him to do. But God said, no, no. You know what? I'll provide the sacrifice. And in the same way, he provided Jesus Christ to be the sacrifice to bring us into that right relationship. When you come into this new life with Jesus Christ, you know, you, you come in like Lazarus. You come out of that grave wrapped in the old clothes of death. Remember, he had the grave clothes on. That's the old habits, the old traditions, the old way of thinking. So Paul says in Romans chapter 12, he says, Now, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Mm. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, mm. so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Hallelujah. Okay? Mm. It's all about worship. Jesus said to the woman at the well, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Mm. We're talking about holy fire here. Yes. You know, when, when Elijah called the people of God up onto Mount Carmel and said, okay, let's have a contest between us and the, the world's religions. God spoke to Zechariah and said, I will bring the third party, he's talking about the remnant, okay, at the time, through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Zechariah 13, 9. John the Baptist, sent to prepare the way for the Lord, said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. When our God, the consuming fire, sends the fire on the altar, the offering is always consumed. So hallelujah. Mm. Father, we just Thank offer Jesus. ourselves to you. We come before you Thank and you. offer ourselves to you oh. in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you until next time. We'll see you then. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best are a world of lost sinners.